Thank you and good morning everyone. I'm Chloe Forster, a partner in the technology and sourcing practice at DLA Piper and UK sector lead for the consumer goods, food and retail sector. I'd like to offer a warm welcome to everyone joining us for this morning's webinar. Is sustainable consumerism an oxymoron? This is a particularly pertinent question for a sector that's not only undergoing a dramatic pace of change due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but is also under pressure to be more sustainable while simultaneously retaining customer loyalty and satisfying shareholders. A fine balancing act indeed. So, can consumerism ever be truly sustainable? I'm delighted to introduce our esteemed panel who will be sharing their thoughts on this complex subject. Today, we're joined by Sarah Webster, Director of Sustainable Business at Britvic PLC, who has responsibility for setting their sustainable business framework, Healthier People, Healthier Planet. David Cross, Global Director of Sustainability, Environment and Human Rights at Reckitt, who's had responsibility for their work on environmental and social sustainability around the world, as well as being chair of the Business Industry Advisory Council's Development Committee. And James Rebanks, farmer and best-selling author of The Shepherd's Life and, most recently, English Pastoral, which examined whether we're becoming slaves to consumerism and the effect that this is having on the rural landscape that each generation inherits. And moderating the session today is business advisor to DLA Piper, former Director General of the Institute of Board Directors, Simon Walker. Thank you all for joining us today. So without further delay, I'm going to hand over to Simon. Thanks, Simon. Chloe, thank you very much indeed. And just to let everyone know, at the bottom of your screen, there should be a little button that says Q&A. So you're welcome to lodge questions at any time uh, throughout our discussion, and we'll come to them later on. But could I ask the panellists, first of all, do we as a society just consume too much? And is the pressure for businesses and economies to grow incompatible with becoming sustainable? Um, David, perhaps we could start with you. Um, yes, thank you for that. Um, do we consume too much? I think it's the question, it's a bit too narrow. It's almost, do we consume too much of the wrong things? Um, and I think what we should be considering is really the impact of what, what we consume and how we consume. I mean, for example, if you're getting um, a nutritious food um, that's benefiting your diet, contributing to self-care, um, helping prevent illness, for example, through better diets, um, is it wrong that it comes in plastic packaging to preserve it? And the question is not necessarily is, is one outweighing another. The question is what's the total impact? And, and the way we tend to approach it now, I think, is that you should be considering the positive impacts you can create and how you can maximise those positive impacts, while at the same time avoiding the negatives. Now, I picked my words very carefully there. It is about avoiding the negatives, not just minimising. I don't think it's enough any longer to talk about minimising harm or stopping doing harm. We have to start to create actual opportunities for regeneration. And that's where more of the challenge lies, because we have not developed our economies thinking about a circular economy approach. Most businesses, um, if you like, had a linear economy as part of their setup phase. And I think we've now got to get to a stage where we think not just in that straight line, but how what we pass on can be part of a circular economy and what we take in can be part of a circular economy. And I don't just mean in terms of the materials that we use, but the total resource platform. Um, and if, if we can work in that way, then you start to, I think, disaggregate growth from the negative impacts we're trying to avoid. Um, and, and, and so it, it's more complex, Simon, than, than do we just consume too much? It's do we consume too much of the wrong things and do we manage them inappropriately that is starting or continuing a decline that we have to reverse? Sarah, what's your view, growth and uh, growth and sustainability? Are they incompatible? I think David has summed it up beautifully, actually. Sometimes you have to think about, you know, how what are we exactly are we talking about? Are we talking about consumables? Are we talking about sort of stuff? And certainly from our perspective, it's all about helping consumers consume better. As David mentioned, you know, helping them stay hydrated helping them reduce their calorie content. Also, you know, help them make the right choices. So putting um, packaging in 
you know, 100% recyclable packaging where we can, because you have to think about the, the knock-on impacts. If you put something, um, you know, in glass, for example, a lot of consumers think, you know, put everything in, in glass, but it's a lot heavier and it uses a lot more water and heat in processing and logistics. So our, our role is making sure that we're using the right packaging and that consumers have all the right tools at, the, uh, at their disposal to uh, understand what, how to dispose of that packaging, put it in the right bin so that it can be you know, recycled and we can create that, that circular um, economy and, and you know, move away from that straight line exactly as, as, as David, David said. So that's, you know, that's our big focus because it's making consumers' lives easier um, and, and better. Simon, thanks. James, what's your th James? What's what's your thinking on this? Uh, so, so yeah, we're, we're definitely consuming too much of the wrong stuff. But I, I, slightly to my surprise, I agree with the other panelists. They're right. This is about encouraging people to make better choices. Uh, David's absolutely right. That the the question in a way is far too simple. Um, we we're cellular life forms. Of course, we we need to eat other <laughs> other things. Um, so unless you think there's a way of getting rid of millions or billions of humans, we are going to have an impact. There is going to be a negative impact of the things that we consume. Uh, we are going to require, at the very least, an enormous amount of calories, an enormous amount of housing materials and other things. Um, so I think you have to unpack, pretty much as the other panellists have said, I think you have to unpack, unpack this and look at what we're consuming and why we're consuming it, how necessary are some of these things. And... and and the thing that I think is really, really hard because we live in such a specialized, fragmented economic system is to, is to do what David said, which is to do the whole circle, to think about how these things are being produced, to think about where they're being produced. Um, so if I, if I bring this back to the level of the field here, um, yes, we might have to make some difficult choices. Some things can be, produ can be produced in a regenerative pastoral way in a northern English landscape where I'm at. Some things can't. And some of that's hard choices. I was, I was listening to a fascinating talk the other night about uh, different kinds of meats. So some people will tell you that industrial intensive pork or chicken are the best meats because they're the most efficient uh, grain converters. But actually, the bit you're missing there is that they're eating grain. And, and grain has to be grown in a certain way. And it, maybe we have to learn to eat different things other than chicken and pork. Uh, either grass-fed beef, beef and lamb that can be done in appropriate landscapes, or it may be things that we've completely forgotten how to eat, things like geese and rabbits, which require no grain and can be produced very, uh, very productively on very small areas in large quantities just from, just from grass in landscapes like ours. So it, it's, a, it's too big a question for a quick glib answer, but I, I'm sort of on the same page as the, as the other panelists, really. We need to think this stuff through very carefully. But... There is no doubt, is there, that we're producing too much stuff that's wrapped in plastic or aluminium, where, where we're producing too much sort of throwaway, one-use stuff. And we do, we're going to have to grow up a little bit and have less of what we, we might like and try, try to be a little bit more, well, a lot more responsible. And, and who is driving the change? Is it, is it consumers or is it companies and, and producers? Um, Sarah, what, what's your thinking? I think uh, there is a small pocket of consumers who are driving this, but they are still a relatively small um, um, pocket versus the mass consumer at the moment. That said, it has changed. So um, if there could ever be a silver lining of, of the pandemic and, you know, we, we struggle to find them, one of, it, one of them is that um, people, has made uh, consumers think of society as a whole as opposed to the individual. And that could act as a catalyst and an accelerator to people behaving the right way, people demanding the right products from us as, as producers. But, you know, the manufacturers and civil society and government, we all have a role to play here to help consumers make the right choices. Um, we only have to think about the complexity of our recycling and which bin does which go in and how much space do you need in your house for all your recycling bins to know how difficult it is for everybody to, to do the right thing. Um, but there are examples of it working. I think sort of the, the soft drinks levy in the, um, in the soft drinks industry, the way we'll work together uh, there is a great example of reducing calories. 
Um, and another example, just uh, you know, a few weeks ago, um, Circularity Scotland is another example of industry pulling together. And these guys are going to be sort of the uh, administrators of the deposit return scheme that is um, is planning to sort of launch next year in Scotland. And we will see that as we've seen in Europe move around sort of the, the, the UK, expand to the UK. So there, there are examples, um, but it's more about, I think, companies um, and governments and civil society working together to help consumers move in that direction rather than a mass uh, consumer drive. David, what's the, what's the record experience? I mean, is it is it you or is it your consumers? Um, I think it's both, um, and I'm going to disagree a little bit with Sarah because I think I think we're seeing more consumers um, looking for more sustainable, if I use that phrase, um, products and services. Um, yes, it's still true. I agree that um, there is a relatively small group who seek them out all of the time, but what I am seeing is a a broader demand growing. Uh, and we see that in a range of ways. And we even, you know, we all saw it even uh, in terms of non-recyclable coffee cups from, from various chains when we could still go into, um, into coffee shops pre-pandemic. And, and there was a big change of foot around that. What I'm seeing is there's, there's a broad push towards more sustainable products. And there's a, um, a, actually a growing level of dissatisfaction with companies that don't perform. Um, now, that's a subtle difference between consumers who will um, avoid less sustainable products and the small group who actively pursue all of the time the most sustainable products. But the direction of travel is clear. And I think the pandemic has exacerbated that or, or strengthened it, whichever way you want to look, in the sense that the pandemic, for my, to my mind, has um, really drawn out the sense that if you are not making a more positive contribution to society. If you're self-serving as an organization, I use the, the broader sense, not just as a business, if you're self-serving and you're not um, making a more broad contribution and playing a more citizenship role, if you like, in society, then at the very least, you're not playing the part that increasingly is expected as hopefully we come out of the pandemic and the contribution that people saw uh, people being made. And at the worst, you're part of the problem. And so that progressive cultural shift, I think, is driving both consumers and companies and policymakers to, 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 to push for a more sustainable approach. Um, because if you're not part of the solution, then you're part of the problem. And no business wants to be in a position where it's deemed to be part of the problem. Um, and at the same time, there's also growing recognition, I think, that if you're creating more sustainable products, then over time you're more competitive and you're set for a future that is governed by a low carbon, low water economy. And if you're not set up for that, then you're not going to continue to grow over the next few years um, as other stakeholders, investors, for example, would want to see. And that's why when I look at some of the investor conversations, it's no longer just about risk. Are you your risk? Are you avoiding um, stranded assets through carbon, for example? It's also about, are you developing your supply networks or your business or your brands or your uh, engagement with consumers and other stakeholders in a way that creates opportunities for the long term? It's, for example, one of the reasons um, you know, we have developed products that save water particularly for markets where water is increasingly stressed as one of the, the first impacts of climate change, is because we know that consumers without water aren't going to buy a product that requires lots of water to be used, for it to be used. And it makes eminent sense to work in that way. And that's where some of those opportunities are starting to come through. And increasingly, I'm seeing those opportunities being really pushed by other stakeholders as ways of driving the agenda in a different way. James, you're a consumer as well as a producer. Who should be driving the change? Neither. Neither. So the, the question's wrong. Uh, and the word came up in, in what David just said. What drives change is culture. It's culture that drives change, not companies, not shops, not farmers. 
they all deliver change. They're, they're all full of humans that, that are affected by culture and then go on to make things different. But it's the culture that changes. And if you look at the history of this, why, why do we not use DDT on farmland anymore? Because Rachel Carson wrote an incredibly beautiful book called Silent Spring in the 1960s. Uh, even better than that, she reduces it to a two-page fable at the start of the book, which any idiot can understand, even an American politician in the 1960s. And she, she wins. Uh, you're talking about people using culture to change it. And you only have to spend five minutes on social media or to turn on country file or to talk to your gran or to just listen to the radio to realize that the, the culture is changing. The culture of this country, of all countries, is not the same as it was in the 1980s. There is a growing awareness of ecological collapse. There's a growing awareness of climate change. There's a growing awareness that you can't just have everything that you want. That's um, so, some expressions are dying, like the old idea that customer was king. Um, actually, that's not true. Kings, kings get what they want. Customers can't have exactly what they want. We, we're all customers, and we have to accept limits and constraints, and that some things are going to be impossible, and some things are going to be too expensive. So for me, it's, it's not the fact that I'm a farmer that's the significant thing here. It's probably the fact that I'm a writer. Uh, I think writers, artists, other people like that have a disproportionate influence on the way we think about these things. And to give you another example, who got everybody talking last year about climate change and our inability to do anything? Uh, a Swedish schoolgirl who sits down outside the Swedish parliament, uh, Greta Thunberg. Um, th that, that's cultural change in action where a, a young woman says, hang on a minute, you, you've grown up so crazy, you're not doing anything about this. And suddenly, suddenly the, the heat's on. Everybody has to th take that more seriously. That doesn't mean that other people aren't thinking about it. But I think culture is what drives this. I, th I think, and the culture is changing really, really rapidly. Yeah, you, you've been a very strong critic of the way food is produced in particular. Um, are you optimistic that, that that's changing? I mean, you know, Rachel Carson was, was 60 years ago. Are things moving fast enough? Uh, no, they're not moving fast enough. Uh, the question is, am I optimistic that change will come? Y yes, change is going to happen. It's going to happen one of two ways. We're either... We're either smart enough and big enough to make change happen quite quickly and in a grown-up, sensible way where we bite the bullets, or change will happen later and it'll happen in a much more crude, ugly, painful way. Because, but there isn't an option where change doesn't happen because we're going to get we're going to get ourselves into a real mess. Um, yeah. These are not issues that are going to go away by being stubborn. Um, so I am optimistic that change will come. But if I if I take it back from the sort of meta level down to the local level. In the landscape where I live, um, I'm not some sort of strange hippie creature from out, out of space that cares about these things. Uh, about half of the farmers in the valley where I live uh, are now obsessed with uh, farming in ways that are better for soil, are obsessed with the biodiversity on their land, are trying to work out how to cram as much biodiversity, as many trees as possible into their farming systems, are trying to work out how to, how to have cyclical nutrient systems so they're not reliant on... Um, Ammonia nitrate and other fossil fuel based um, uh, providers of nutrients. And, and again, the culture is changing. That culture trickles down into valleys like ours, into, onto farmland like ours. And people are saying, hang on a minute, we, as one of the other panelists said, we cannot be part of the problem. We have, we have to be sorting this out. So, short answer yes, I am actually optimistic. I have quite a lot of faith in human, human beings' ability to, to learn quickly to to listen to evidence, to start to change things. And yeah, I, I, think, I think companies and individuals and farmers that don't embrace that, that don't embrace change, that aren't willing to be progressive, are going to find themselves very quickly out of step with the public. And, and they're not going to be selling their product. They're not going to be having the public on their side. And that's a massive driver in my community where we want the British public to be on the side of British farmers. Well, just to remind everybody about the Q&A button, questions are starting to come in, but do feel free to lodge questions at any point. Um, David and Sarah, um, consumers are becoming a lot more demanding. Your companies must be facing pressures on issues like single-use packaging. How are your brands reacting to that, that pressure from sustainability-minded consumers? And, and are your customers willing to put up with higher prices. Um, Sarah, can we start with you? Um, thank you, Simon. That's, that's a great question. And for, for us, the material issues for us, as you'd imagine, are calories 
and also plastic packaging, as we've already talked about. And we've got a we've got a you know a good track record on soft drinks because you know over seventy five percent of our of our drinks globally um, are low or no sugar. And in the UK and Ireland, ninety nine percent of of our brands um, of, the, of the Britfit brands are outside of 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 the levy. Um, and regulation has done um, a great job of bringing everybody up. So the whole industry now, I think, sort of two thirds of the industry in the UK is uh, is low no low no sugar. Um, and so it's about what what's next in terms of sort of healthier consumer choices. So we do have uh, Robinson's Cordials that have super berries in, and um, Mawadi in Ireland um, is being sort of um, launched this month with added vitamins and and zinc. Um, and there is there is more um, to, to go there. Um, the big the, the big thing as well, and we've talked about it, is is um, plastic. Um, and this uh, da- David talked about it in his very first answer. Plastic is a very good solution for moving things around in a light way, keeping products safe, particularly when you're thinking about food. But what ha- it becomes a, a problem when it becomes waste. Uh, so it's how do we stop that becoming waste? Um, and also, let's make sure that we are using um, recycled PET. So by the end of next year, um, all of our uh, products in GB will be in recycled PET um, bottles. All of, all of our bottles will be. We've already got Ballygowan um, and Fruit Shoot Hydro. Um, and we'll see more clearly move over the next the next 18 months very, very, um, very, very quickly. With regard to price, that's a really interesting point. Um, and I think when it comes, it depends what the issue is. So when it comes to packaging, consumers just expect you to deliver packaging at the right quality. And they just expect you to put it in recycled packaging anyway. Um, and I, I don't think they are prepared to pay a premium for that. Because what's the added value? It's still coming in a bottle. Um, However, when you're getting to talking about more natural products and value added, then our research shows that they are prepared to pay a bit of a premium. Now, of course, you've got to there's there's what people say and what people do is is um, is uh, is often quite different. Um, but that is that is what we have what we have found. So you know, I don't believe they will pay more for recycled packaging, but there's more of a chance that they will pay more if you're giving them, you know, that what's actually inside the packaging is worth more to them. David, are your customers happy to pay for all this? Well, I think it's a little bit, as, as, as Sarah said, um, Simon, people value different things and they're prepared to pay for things that they value more. But as something becomes the norm, then they start to look for, an addition to that or an incremental value that they're looking again for. And so um, I don't think people are prepared necessarily to pay for just recycled or recyclable packaging. They expect that to become the norm. And frankly, if we don't respond to that, um, then not just consumer preference, but also taxation on non-recyclable materials will grow and grow and grow. And as James said earlier, the businesses who don't respond probably won't be in business in a few years' time. Um, And so it's partly about how we react to what consumers are saying, and it's partly how we look to create opportunities for the future and react and respond to it. And it isn't just about whether something is going to create pollution. It's about the total life cycle of a product and the fact that if you're not disposing of it, there's a carbon footprint issue. We need to take all of those things into account. But at the same time, there are great opportunities. I am looking, I was only looking yesterday at something that we've done that um, is is changing the way that of the the nature of the products and how it is sold. So moving to concentrates, moving to refill approaches, reducing, for example, the amount of plastic packaging by 75% on a a disinfectant spray that obviously people have been buying a lot of in the last 12 months. And and by rethinking that, not only do you just reduce the amount of plastic um, packaging that is used, you also increase the um, numbers of products you can ship per pallet, and that reduces the carbon footprint per product, and so on and so forth. So it makes eminent sense to work in that sort of way. Um, And I think 
what you see is a mixture um, of, of businesses responding to changes in resource availability, the types of resources that we have, and consumers also changing their expectation around it and wanting to play a more active role through how they purchase, and policymakers um, changing the dynamic, recognising that if you get it wrong, it costs us all as a planetary society um, to put it right, if we can put it right. And you put all those things together, and it's that, it's that culture shift and I thought James's point about how that culture shift is developing was, was really well made, because for me, that is what is happening. What was acceptable even five years ago is not acceptable now. I mean, how long is it since Sir David Attenborough on Blue Planet? It is less than three years since we saw that on the BBC. And in that time period, the whole dynamic around plastic and packaging has changed substantially. And James said it really well. How we communicate around these things will continue to drive that culture shift, as well as having products and running organisations and businesses and how we all consume will continue to, to change that, that culture around things. What was acceptable 50 years ago is no longer acceptable now, and that pattern will continue for sure. And if you don't change with it, then the cost of running a business or the cost of consuming those less sustainable things will just go up and the market force will drive it out, as well as the cultural expectation that you're part of the problem, not part of the solution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sarah, Britvix pledged to be carbon neutral by 2050. How do you get your staff to buy in to a, 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 a really ambitious commitment on sustainability as a sort of key corporate aim? How do you incentivize them? Uh, great question, and uh, and it starts from the top. Um, and you know, David touched on it before. I think the business case has never been stronger. Our investors demand it. Our customers and our consumers demand it. Our employees demand it of us. They are asking us to do more. Um, and if we don't act, then regulators and policymakers will will make will you know will will force our hand. So in many respects, you know, they are they are expecting the leaders um, in our business to do more. And, you know, it, it does start from from the top as well, because it is how you know what is it that our leaders are saying and doing, um, because it's not just what they're talking about. Um, so that is that is a key thing. So the talking about it more, we now we're now using a people, planet and performance lens in that order or trying to because we're trying to shift the dial this isn't an overnight change when you're trying to change culture you have to do it you know it's it's it, it can't be done over overnight um and one of those things um to to change it a little bit faster perhaps is to make sure that people are remunerated on it so if we take as of this year sort of the, the top 80 leaders of our organization 20 percent of their bonus will be dependent on us achieving our healthier people, healthier planet targets this year. That always focuses the mind, I find. Um, we are also making sure that um, carbon and water is considered in our decision making. And if it is going to have a negative impact, how are we going to mitigate against that? And also thinking about longer time, time horizons. So that's sort of how we're sort of getting into the decision making of it. And then with sort of the, um, the broader em employee base as well, you know, we did a, a survey last year. So we started a, um, um, an engagement program um, and to understand our baseline. So that's how we know they expect us to do more. Um, and we've, we've launched a new, um, a, a new employee training program with a number of modules focused on each of the areas of, of our strategy and helping them understand why is it important for us as Britvic and how they can how they can play their part. But equally, we've got a lot of manufacturing sites. So it's how do you, what's the platform for that? How do you target everybody um, in, in the appropriate way with the appropriate hooks and make it important for them? Uh, so there is no silver bullet. We're working on it. We're trying to change the culture within within the business. 
Um, and uh, with that in mind, hopefully change the culture outside of the business uh, as well. So um, still early days, but I think we're, we, we're making progress. Great. Um, James, could we talk about meat? I mean, it's widely accepted that meat consumption has a harmful effect, both because of techniques and because of the, the sheer quantity um, needed. Um, you're a sheep and cattle farmer. You've tried to raise awareness of the role of grazing animals in the ecosystem and f- the need for fertile soil. Um, what's the future? I mean, is it is it is it those techniques or is it lab grown meat or plant based protein products? I I I'm going to take a side swipe at the question, which is I, I think whatever you eat, whatever you're producing, what, whatever your nutrition is, it needs to come from a from an ecosystem that works, that has a nutrient cycle that t- t- sustains the native habitats, sustains the, the dynamic natural processes that were there previously, which means that the flora and fauna of those landscapes can continue to thrive and prosper in them. Um, does that tell you what you should eat? No, I don't think it does. I think you can still choose to be a vegan, a vegetarian, or a meat eater at the end of the day. I think in in northwestern Europe, where we're very good at growing grass, I think it'd be very hard to argue that we should switch to not eating meat and that we should eat things produced a very long way away in artificial ways, which we know aren't as good for us, have all sorts of problems with them, aren't anywhere near as sustainable as we think they are. So if I bring that back to my farm, what am I What am I actually saying? Is eating meat from my farm a problem? Well, no. I'm, I'm going to be slightly cheeky to Sarah here. Even though I like her, we're already not carbon neutral. We're carbon positive. On our farm, we use uh, animal grazing. We're 50 tons a year. On a small family farm, we're 50 tons a year carbon positive. So that's sequestering 50 tons more than we release from all sources. We've just planted another 20,000 trees. We're going to be massive for our scale. We're going to be massively carbon positive. And have we done that by switching to a plant-based diet or growing arable crops which plough the ground? No, the exact opposite. Ploughing is one of the worst things to grow arable crops that you can do. It releases masses of carbon. It creates monocultures. Um, The right kind of grazing in the right place can replicate natural processes that our flora and fauna like. So there are a few ifs and buts in that. You've got to have the right patchwork landscape, the right kind of grazing management, But if you do those things, there's no reason why meat can't be part of a healthy diet. Now, take that. Let's let's address the sort of thorny issue here. Is is all beef, all lamb, all all pork produced in that way? No, it is not. It's produced, much of it's produced using corn or uh, palm kernel or sort of uh, secondary products from soy and and, uh, other things that are grown in Indonesia or the Amazonian rainforest should we be should we be eating less of that stuff yes so it's a little bit like the first question we started with here today I don't think I don't think a knee-jerk swing towards fake foods or to sort of very weird gunky products is the answer I think probably what the nutritionists are telling us is that we need to eat as much real good healthy natural food a good, healthy, natural food is usually produced in a, an environment in which it's fighting its yeah. own battles. It's semi-natural. It's producing its own antitoxins. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, I think if you listen to the listen to the nutritionists, we need to be eating good, real food. The challenge then becomes how do people like the people listening to this webinar help people like me to look after a landscape properly to have all the things we need from it? I think that's the challenge. Brings us to the question of supply chains and global supply chains, which have made uh, things so much more efficient and brought down costs, um, but possibly at the expense of the environment. I mean, should we be producing much more domestically? Um, David, what what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think I think we should. I think we're seeing a shift in what global supply chains look like. In any case. Um, I think the pandemic demonstrated that there's, there is a shift in, in how products move around the world. And there's actually a move towards a more regional or even national level supply network as opposed to just a, just the, if you like, the globalized network um, that we have seen progressively developing over the last 20, 30 years or so. I think we've also, you know, there the are different sides to this. It's too, again, again, Sam, it's a, very, it's a very simplified question that doesn't actually do justice to all the different dynamics that go on. You can't grow everything in the UK um, that we choose to consume. 
Um, and, and, if you, and if you tried to do, you'd be putting a lot more energy into growing certain plants on the glass in various you know, greenhouses and whatever else that's probably not appropriate. You've got to think about the total footprint um, and, and the total ecological impact. Um, to that end, however, I do think we can. W- w- you don't need to move stuff around the world as much as been done. I mean, I find it quite bizarre. Not just you know the sourcing in those some of those supply chains, but the fact that um, things are process. Things might be rear at livestock. And James, I know, will see this because I've spent a lot of time in farming in the UK myself. Um, livestock reared in one part of the country moved to another country to be finished that's fairly standard and we understand the reasons for that but then sometimes then the um after slaughter it might, meat is, is shipped internationally for processing because there's been a consolidation uh, of 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 the manufacturing sites i find that type of that type of movement and the food miles associated with that much more difficult to understand because we've lost the local network that made some of those local supply chains much more sustainable as the manufacturing elements have consolidated. And that's been a challenge. I mean, James, I'm sure you will see this in terms of when I I grew up, when I was training as an environmental health officer in the northwest of England, there were small local slaughterhouses that served a few local farms and I visited them and I spent time with them and they they worked for a, a small group of farms and a few butchers and they worked absolutely fine. Yeah. Then when we had to have um, OVS inspections, then it all suddenly got consolidated. It wasn't practical for it to continue to work in that way because the cost of inspection suddenly yeah. went up. And yes, it was for good reason, but it also started this change in the structural nature of our food supply network. Now, I don't know how we reverse those structural elements, but it's not as simple as saying, should we get ingredient X from country Y and move it across. At the same time, and, and just and, and James, I think you know, I'd love you to come in and say something about this because I know you have an opinion on it. Um, the, the, the point about that James was also making is about animal feed. Shipping soy from the Amazon area, for me, the, to, to Europe, when we could have grass grazing or we could have different forms of animal protein, um, animal feed protein grown more within Europe, it just again, it also seems slightly bizarre to me. And we've yeah. established it um, based on a single economic indicator. And I think we need to be broader in, in the way we judge um, how those supply chains um, and the impact of those supply chains. James, to you. James, yes. Just, just very quickly, uh, sort of chiming in and, and agreeing with David, really, I think one of the things you learn looking at post-war economic history is that we had a very naive belief that consumers were rational and just and good and could make these sort of wise decisions and that shops would exert some sort of ethical power and uh, that would protect us from our worst selves. And I think what you learn when you look at it is that that's not actually a, a sound belief. The, the truth is most consumers, bless them, are very busy. They've got limited information. They're trying to do two jobs. They've got three kids hanging off their arm while they're shopping. Um, they've got limited income because we don't redistribute wealth as well as we might in this country. There's all sorts of things happening there, which means that a consumer walking through a supermarket isn't going to be able to make perfect, wise decisions. That's just not going to happen if you rely on that. Likewise, Sarah, Sarah has to keep that person happy. And if she doesn't produce things at the right price in the right packet, she'll go out of business. So there has to be something out with the consumer and the, and the company producing the stuff. And we know what that is. It's, it's, it's good government. It's good regulation. It's taking the wrong things off the shelf. It's passing laws which stop the wrong processes. It's stopping people like me farming in ways that are destructive of soil or bad for animal welfare that there have to be things outside the consumer and the company that's not disrespecting either but that's how we break this loop and i think we're naive if we don't acknowledge that yeah but what about the relocation of some manufacturing businesses to environments other countries where environmental and sustainability controls just are much less demanding and less challenging than the sort of thing you've been talking about here um, well, I'm, Sarah. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I, okay. sorry, just really quickly. Sorry, Sarah. I, I would. People talk about food security. What we should really be talking about is food, food trust, and food control. Do we trust other people? 
okay, they may it may cost a little bit more to do some things in the UK. And I agree with David, we shouldn't do everything here. Uh, it may cost more, but it's down the road from you. You can send your regulator, you can send your yeah. welfare officer, you can control it. I think we need to be really careful about this idea of outsourcing things out of sight. And I, I'll stop now because I'm it being on to say it. In, in a kind of free world, I mean, you are going to have the opportunity for businesses to move their activities um, around. Um, Sarah, what, what are your thoughts? Well, I think we've touched on it in a number of places already this morning. There has been and there is more of a cultural shift. It is no longer acceptable to pass it off. You can see that with a lot of the dialogue around the fashion industry at the moment. Um, There is much greater scrutiny of supply chains. Um, Those companies, those of us have signed up for science-based targets, it's scopes one and two, which are more direct, and scope three is indirect. So therefore, it doesn't matter where that impact is in the world, we have to act on it. Um, And I I think the, um, the most successful businesses going forward are the ones who respond to that, who mitigate, who aim to be, you know, net positive. Brilliant, Jack, James. Thank you. Um, I'll have to try and find it. See if my local butcher uses uses your meat. <laughs> um, and uh, but it's it's no longer acceptable. It is it you know, will lead to huge reputational damage, and then our consumers and our customers and our investors will turn their back. On those, on those companies who do not behave in the right way. Um, it may have been done historically to get the right cost. Now, managing a business purely for cost is not sure. the way to be a successful business. Um, and I think those who behave in the right way, make decisions in the right way, understand some of, there are going to be compromises, but we have to understand what our hotspots are, what our impacts are, and then we have to mitigate against it or, or avoid it. Um, and that is the way that we make ourselves resilient for, you know, for everyone going forward. And those are the companies who are going to be more successful in the future. D- David, um, Rickett Binkis is a real multinational. I mean, doesn't regulatory, the regulatory environment have something to do with where you produce things? Um, of course, it does to an extent, Simon. But actually, what really defines it is 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 the marketplaces we're trying to serve. Um, and as I was saying earlier, increasingly, you don't want to be shipping stuff um, on a global basis because of the challenges we've seen in the last twelve months created by the pandemic and, and, and issues in moving not just products around, but in getting ingredients to you. Um, but I also go back to, to the point that uh, both Sarah and James made. You need to know where ingredients come from. You need to know where the materials come from. If you don't know those, then first of all, how do we trust those ingredients? And how on earth could you expect consumers to trust those ingredients if we don't know where they come from? And once you know where you, they come from, then you begin to be able to think about the impacts and act on the impacts of sourcing them in certain ways. And you can start to mitigate and avoid the potential adverse impact and maybe also even create more regenerative approaches. And, you know, a classic example in recent years and I, uh, about, you know, about this was, was the horse mink situation in the UK, which is now you know, nearly a decade ago, but was a classic example of people not knowing where certain ingredients were coming from. Now, I was fortunate at the time to work for a supermarket, and we knew the 1,017, and it was the number at the time, beef farmers who supplied to us. And that made an awful lot of difference, not just because we had traceability, but we had confidence and we had trust, and our consumers had trust. And that's critical. And the same is true now. In a different scale, um, I I see this in other commodities. Um, When I worked in, in the chocolate sector, I didn't know all the thousands or the millions of farmers in West Africa, but I knew where where the cocoa came from and how we sourced them. And we could work with those cocoa farmers to prevent some of the worst challenges that they were facing and actually to create a more sustainable farming approach where they made more money and there was a better ecological balance in terms of growing cocoa under shade. 
The same, I see the same now in the work we've just announced in recent times about working with small latex farming communities. And these guys are are farming, you know, maybe 20 hectares of rubber plantation. It's not really a plantation when it's 20 hectares. The challenges they face are socioeconomic as much as environmental. And, And unless we help them to tackle some of those socioeconomic issues, then they're not going to look after the natural environment that they're part of. But we need them to do that as well. And that's why we're working with Fair Rubber um, to look both at the income that they have and therefore how we can help them to have a more regenerative approach in the farming that they do. And you only get to, to be able to do that when you know the origins of the material. And not knowing that, frankly, is unacceptable in this, this day and age, in my opinion. Because I'm that move on to questions. To understand the total network. I'm going to move on to questions from people who are logged on in just a second. But if I could ask, and just to remind you, one the Q and A button is, is there at the bottom of the screen. But if I could just ask James before we do that, you've said this is the most exciting time ever to be a, a farmer in the UK with sort of endless opportunities ahead. How do you think food is going to be produced in the future? And what role can the big companies that we're talking to today and other companies play in helping you? Yeah, I, I, I think, to use some words, I think David used earlier, the, the direction of travel is really, really clear here, that what British people are increasingly going to ask for, probably starting in the sort of higher socioeconomic categories and then dripping down as people have can afford to, is they're going to care more and more about where the food comes from and how it's produced And they're going to care more and more about their landscapes and they're going to find it deeply unsatisfying, deeply problematic that we're losing things like bees, that we're losing farmland birds and other things. They're going to say, hang on a minute, what are you people doing? What are you farmers doing? What are you companies doing that's allowing this stuff to happen? Why aren't you looking after it properly? So um, I think uh, the reason I think the future is exciting for British farmers is I think we can do this. We're not all doing it yet, but we can do this. We can get out in front of this. We know more about soil, we know more about biodiversity, we know more about recreating habitats around our farming than we've ever known before. We know more about farming uh, very productively and very regeneratively than we've ever known before by managing things like grazing better, managing soils better. Um, We can do it. The problem at the moment is I don't get paid any more for what I produce when I do those things. So the, the second part of the question, what role can companies play I need, I need people like David, people like Sarah, people like yourself and the people listening to this to come down the track, to come down the food chain to me and talk to me. I need them to, to turn up in my field. I know that's not your day job all of the time, but I need you to come to my field and talk this through and understand the choices I face. That if you want to pay £10 for that thing, I have to do it in a pretty shoddy, world-destroying way. If you want to pay £15, I can look after things okay. And if you want to pay £20... I might be able to look after the landscape in a perfect way. And we need to talk about how we'd communicate that to consumers, how we'd get that message out, and how we'd persuade people in your shops um, and your businesses to do that in a way that you can make a, a profit from and that I can make a sustainable living from. So far from thinking that Sarah and David and others are the, are the bad guys and girls in this, I, I, I think you're our partners. We, yeah. we need to be talking and we need to be addressing these things in a really grown-up way. And if we have to go back to the public with some difficult home truths, if we have to lobby government together to stop some of the worst stuff coming in or displacing us on the shelf, then, then that's what we have to do. But I think this has to be a much more joined up, much more ethical conversation than it's been in the past. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to move to the questions of people who are, who are watching. Um, the first one actually follows directly from what James has been saying about culture. Is Are the changes being pushed for by Generation Z in particular, is that going to make a permanent difference uh, or is it just a temporary trend? Um, Sarah, can I go to you on that? Um, I, I think it's, I, I think, I hope it's going to be permanent uh, because the way that we have been living historically is not sustainable. Um, and we see it from not only our consumers, but as I said, our, our employees. And the pandemic, again, has shown us that consumerism isn't the be all and end all. We know that the, having more stuff doesn't make you feel better, which is the first question at the beginning of the call. Actually going outside, walking around, you know, James's farm, enjoying the landscape is far better holistically. It's having that balance. 
And people are appreciating that more and more. And then another really p- key piece, and, and David touched on it too, is you can't have healthier people without healthier planet, which is what where our strategy is focused on. They are all interchangeably linked. Um, and uh, I, I think as people think more and more about their well-being, we've seen the well-being trends in, in um, sort of consumer FMCG for well over sort of 10, 15 years now. And it is moving up. It is, you know, it is becoming more mainstream and people are putting values um, Gen Z very much putting values on, you know, not not having more stuff, but ex- experiences, and that includes in going out and enjoying the natural environment, and knowing and trusting the products that you are consuming and using. Um, and I, I see it as something that is here to stay and just accelerate. I've got a question to go direct to James from someone who's logged on. Um, can Britain ever produce the food it needs? locally and sustainably, considering the population density and the available land mass? Okay, so I would, um, for people who want the, the, the really clever, lifelong studied version, version of the answer to this question, there's a book called Feeding Britain by Professor Tim Lang, which I would direct people to. Just a really brilliant academic answer to that. But the, the short answer is, uh, we can produce massively more fruit, veg, nuts, etc., in the in the UK um, than we do. We've slipped into bad habits of not doing that. There's very little reason why we couldn't do more of that. Um, at the moment, we produce about 55, 60% of the food that we eat in the UK on the British uh, landmass. Can we produce more? Yes. Uh, would we ever want to produce all of it? No, David's absolutely right. The days of growing bananas under greenhouse lamps in West Cumbria are, are frankly gone, and they're gone for lots of good reasons. Um, but if we, with some, with some tweaks to our national diet, uh, a little bit of more self-discipline, a bit more education, a little bit more getting back to eating some of the things seasonally that we can grow in the UK, there's no reason why we can't grow considerably more than that 60% here. And I... I think there are very strong arguments for doing that. Um, And I think they were highlighted when we started to have food panic buying and things last March and when we started to get quite concerned for the first time in a generation or two about where the food's coming from. I, I would, I would get, I would urge all of you when you go to bed tonight and you've got five minutes and you just before you turn the light off, think about where you're going to go. If if we ever have a really bad crisis, where are you going to go to feed your family? And I would, I would strongly suggest that having a decent share of your diet available within walking distance of where you live is probably not a bad idea for a sensible, safe society. David, a question probably best directed at you. Do we see the need uh, to look at alternative packaging, uh, removing packing, um, as the end of the multi-pack deal era? And if that's the case, how are you going to get that across to your customers um, how are you going to persuade consumers that that makes sense? Well, it's already starting, Simon. It is already starting. I mean, we're seeing things, uh, different types of packaging. I mentioned um, a few moments ago about refills. We're seeing refills coming in. We're using refills more. We're using um, concentrates, all of which means you're shipping less. At the same time, we're also seeing refills start to work in a different way, actually in communities. Um, you know, in supermarkets, in apartment blocks. We're doing trials um, in the US and in Europe around um, a a system called Loop where a certain, you know, the consumer hell bit of packaging just rotates in effect and gets refilled. The challenge is making that sort of approach scalable and still relatively cost-effective for people. But those methods are coming in and they're coming in quickly. And it goes back to what you were saying about Gen Z. Um, And that's not just Gen Z. I think the expectation and the direction of travel is shifting because people, in fact, we should stop talking about consumers. We should start talking about citizens because increasingly people want to know that the impact they are having is not damaging. And they want to work with people to take products from people that is not damaging. And they want to behave as more of a citizen in supporting what is a more sustainable future for them, their families, and actually for everybody. And that, I think, has been accelerated through the pandemic. Um, That expectation that I talked about at the outset, 
that we all contribute towards a wider, more positive societal impact. Otherwise, you're part of the problem. And that's, not, that's no longer acceptable. And you will either be penalised for it because, as James said earlier, the policy and the cost of working in a certain way will go up driven by policy and regulation, and or you'll, the people who buy products from you and even the people who work with you and your, you yourself will start to find it unacceptable not to work in that way. That's citizenship, and that is what is driving a lot of change at the moment. Is it going as fast as some of us would like? No, I don't think so. But it is definitely there, and it is definitely a growing momentum. I've got a last question I'd like to put to all of you for a a brief response. Um, We've talked about government and regulation and the role it can play. Is there anything we can learn from other countries about ethical consumerism? Norway is cited as somewhere where recycling has achieved a 97% recovery rate on plastic bottle waste. I mean, what are the examples from other places you, you could cite? Sarah, perhaps to start with you? Uh, I think, yeah, the D- DRS, deposit return schemes that we're seeing in Europe and that we will see in this country over the next few years, absolutely uh, fundamental. Currently, recycling rates of um, of plastic bottles are around about 50% in this market, and we expect DRS to take that to over, over 90%. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, it comes back to balance. I think some of our you know, the the consumer citizens, uh, to David's point, in in some of the Nordic countries, do understand um, that that balance between um, between having experiences, enjoying the natural environment, as well as consuming uh, consuming things. Um, so I think you probably touched on the, the one that's most material for our business is definitely um, that recycling mentality and also re- reusing and finding alternatives because there isn't, you know, that I, I don't see a world entirely without plastic, but I see a world with alternatives as well, whether that is through dispense, whether it's through refillables, um, whether that is through um, people using their, um, you know, their, their bottles, their reusable water bottles and putting some, some squash in, in that. Um, so those are, th- those are the material ones uh, for us. Okay. David? Uh, yes, I, mean, I think... You know, we, I, I see lessons in, in lots of places. And, and one of the most important things, I, I believe, is actually joining the dots up differently and using those lessons from elsewhere. You know, necessity is often the mother of invention. When I, when I travel um, and I go to places like India, uh, where water is already highly stressed, um, the way that people are working to uh, reuse, recycle, of you know, reduce the amount of water that is being used because they have few choices is, is really apparent. And it changes your understanding um, of how you use resources when you see scarcity. We're fortunate in this country in many ways that we, we haven't faced those sorts of challenges, but we are starting to do so. And the costs of having to deal with things are growing up fast. I mean, I remember... Um, seeing a situation in, in the southwest of the country where farmers in, in the uplands of Exmoor and Dartmoor were being paid ecosystem services payments so that the water authority did not have to treat the water in the same way to, reduce, yeah. to remove things like fertilizers or pesticides that they would otherwise have had to remove the drinking water. So you know, that's where it starts to create that element, as I was talking about earlier, about how do you think about changing that horizontal line into something that is part of the arc of a circle? And we can take lessons from many, many parts of the world around that, better infrastructure, more creative solutions, um, different ways of working, and also just ways of engaging with people. Right. That's where one of the powerful things that business can offer is how we engage well with, with, with people around the world. Business is very good at doing that. Sometimes government is less good at doing that. And I James, think- a quick last thought from you. Just a quick last one. You stole, you stole my best answer, which is Norway, because for me, the answer is always Norway, whatever the question is. But <laughs> um, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan. But um, I, slightly surprisingly, we, we do do some things well. So if you look back 
things like uh, free range chickens in Britain. We have massively um, a much greater percentage of chickens are free range in the UK than anywhere else. And to give credit where it's due, it's because the culture changed overnight. There were some scandals in the 1980s about animal welfare and battery hens. There was a, an outpouring of public dissatisfaction with that. And the, the major retailers, the supermarkets, who I'm often not a fan of, but on that occasion did something really good. They basically said, we don't like that. We don't want that on our shelves. People are complaining about it. And there was a big shift. So you had the things coming together, culture, public awareness, retailers, wholesalers stepping up and saying, OK, now's the time. Let's do Let's be bold. Let's make a big change. So we're not always dreadful at these things. There are examples in our past that we can learn from. Thank you very much indeed. It's been a fascinating discussion. So thank you from me and uh, over to Chloe for a thank you from DLA Piper. And I think all that remains for me to do is to thank Sarah, David, James and Simon for giving up their time and sharing their insights with us today and to thank you all for taking the time to join us. We'll be in touch shortly with a copy of the recording of the session and to share some further insights from the data we've gathered in the run up to the event. If any of you do have any questions that we didn't get to, then I'm sorry, but if you'd like to discuss any of them, please do get in touch either with me or with your usual DLA Piper contact. Thank you all and I wish you a pleasant day.